Welcome back to Land Matters, the podcast of the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. I'm your host, Anthony Flint. Well, with this show, we wrap up 2020, a year that I think for most of us can end soon enough. With this show, we want to look back on what the year has meant for cities, but look ahead as well and pose the big question, how will the pandemic and growing awareness of racial justice and disparities, and don't forget the climate crisis, help shape the cities of the future? First, a disclaimer of sorts, I want to recognize we're in another excruciating time right now. Vaccines will soon be available, but in the meantime, the coronavirus remains on a rampage. So many deaths and hospitalizations, business closures, evictions, and severely strained state and local governments. Some places are already going back into lockdown. Yet if we're to be hopeful, vaccines will ultimately change the calculus of how we live and work, possibly by the spring or the summer. Things will be different. We'll still be on guard, maybe for the next airborne pathogen, but I think it's natural to wonder about what life might look like by that time next year. Looking back at history, the 1918 Spanish flu, by some accounts, was almost entirely quickly forgotten after it happened, but there were some lasting effects. Those unadorned white walls you see in 20th century modernism were de rigueur in part because they could be easily cleaned and washed down. The emphasis on hygiene translated to sprawling one-story elementary schools that you can basically find anywhere today. Indoor-outdoor space, in the form of things like terraces and roof gardens, came to be valued. That bathroom in the front entryway of millions of suburban homes? Well, that became standard issue to fulfill the new mandate for washing your hands. Those are just a few examples, but the point is, that pandemic did prompt a response and some new ways of designing and arranging our physical world. What might we see this time around? Joining me on the Land Matters podcast are two thought leaders in all things urban. Emily Badger is a reporter for the New York Times and writes about cities and urban policy for The Upshot from the Washington Bureau. She's been interested in housing, transportation, and inequality, and how they're all connected. She joined The Times in 2016 from the Washington Post. Diana Lind is a writer and urban policy specialist just out with a new book, Brave New Home, our future in smarter, simpler, happier housing. She currently leads the Arts and Business Council for Greater Philadelphia and also serves on the management team of the Chamber of Commerce for Greater Philadelphia. Before that, she was editor-in-chief of Next City, a leading urbanist website and nonprofit, and then executive director of that organization. First, Emily, let's start with you to take stock. In terms of density, mobility, affordability, What has 2020 taught us about cities? What was revealed? I keep coming back to the idea that we have learned so much that is really discouraging about the fragility of our social safety net in cities and in the United States and the fragility of all of our kind of social infrastructure that was doing a lot of really heavy lifting that I think a lot of people didn't appreciate. I didn't fully appreciate how much work schools were doing to feed children until they weren't sites for delivering meals to kids anymore. We didn't fully appreciate that public pools were a place that was providing supervision to kids in neighborhoods when adults aren't around, or that libraries, public libraries, are this essential infrastructure that provides air conditioning to elderly people who may not have it in their own home. All of these ways that these different kinds of infrastructure in our cities were doing multiple jobs beyond what we think of as their core mission. And all of that stuff went away this year. All of a sudden, we can no longer count on teachers in schools to be the first responders identifying when we think children are having problems at home or are experiencing some kind of abuse. And so taking all of that stuff away made it much more visible to me, and I think to a lot of other people as well. And on the one hand, perhaps sort of the positive way of looking at that is that we'll have a newfound appreciation for a lot of these different kinds of infrastructure in our communities and all of the work that they're doing. But the negative way of looking at that is, what does it say about our sort of actual formal social safety net in American cities that we are not providing for people's 
needs through, you know, affordable housing that's got air conditioning in it, through, you know, sort of reliable systems of, of aftercare and daycare, through a stronger food stamp program, through, you know, any number of other sort of social safety net things that we have come to rely on, you know, teachers to be doing this work, lifeguards at pools. That's been very alarming to me. And I think, you know, watching what our civic life has looked like in the absence of all of these things is absolutely going to change how I look at each of those elements of our communities going forward when we do get back to something that's more like normal. Diana, what jumped out at you that 2020 exposed or underscored, perhaps about housing in particular? Well, I think in cities in general, but in housing in particular, we've really seen two different cities, two different housing markets. So, you know, on the one hand, you see the millions of people across the country at risk of eviction right now and the scramble to provide rent assistance and support both to renters and to landlords to ensure that people are housed at this time. And then at the same very moment, we're seeing a housing market that's completely on fire, especially the second home market is seeing double digit gains in all of the top markets in coastal America. So like, you know, Cape Cod, not far from the Lincoln Institute, saw something like housing prices increase by 90% this summer. So that kind of disparity between these two Americas, I think, has really been exposed in our cities and particularly in housing. That, I think, is one thing that is going to be one of the revelations of the year. And it's not something new, but it was so stark this year. I also think that when Emily mentioned fragility, that was definitely a word that I have been thinking about in terms of how cities feel right now, in terms of seeing how stores, museums, libraries, restaurants went through so much this summer to try to make their businesses and organizations work. And then now to be in this position where in Philadelphia, where I live, we've closed indoor dining, we've closed our museums and libraries again. And so it just sort of feels like the certainty which many people have taken for granted in in sort of how to operate their business, their organization, or their family has completely fallen apart in terms of it feels very fragile right now. And so without that kind of underlying certainty for so many people, it's very hard to be able to make plans or to figure out where to go from there in terms of what does economic recovery look like in a lot of these places when there's no certainty that, you know, we really should be focusing on retail recovery, for example. The last thing I'll mention that this year has really revealed is so many trends have been accelerated this year. So you see that in housing. There's been a lot of discussion about people moving from cities into suburbs. I think that was really sort of a trend that just was accelerated by this particular moment where a generation of you know people in their 30s who were perhaps in the next five years going to move to the suburbs took this as a, along with rock bottom interest rates, as a chance for them to move out to the suburbs. But also in terms of retail, when you look at some of the discussion of what has been happening to downtown business cores, the, the kind of retail that had been the standard and reliable was really starting to fall apart in a lot of places, even before the pandemic. And so some of these retailers who had been chipped away at by e-commerce and kind of upstart other businesses are really seeing that kind of disruption be accelerated at this point. So I think that the year found that things that were going to maybe happen and unfold over the next three to five years actually just happened in nine months. Okay, so now on to the question of how 2020 will potentially reshape or fundamentally change how we live and work. Are we headed straight back to the way it was, making all this like a months-long bad dream, or will there really be some fundamental shifts? Emily, let's take one idea that's gained attention, promoted by the C40 Group and others, the 15-minute city. Can you explain that and how it would work? It sounds like several small cities or urban villages or neighborhoods, really, instead of one big city. Yeah, so the 15-minute city is this ideal that suggests that we should aspire to having neighborhoods 
where everyone can reach the things that are most sort of essential to you in your daily life within 15 minutes by foot, by bike, by transit, not necessarily requiring you to get into a car. So, you know, everyone should be within close reach of a grocery store and your child's school and a pharmacy and public library, things like that, that we think are important. And, and obviously, many, many communities, especially in the United States, where we're so car dependent, do not at all resemble this today. And this is an idea that has really been imported by a lot of cities, specifically from Paris, where they have really been embracing this idea and trying to enact it. And I think it's sort of caught hold in this moment right now because we have all been living in these really sort of shrunken, circumscribed spaces over the last nine months. I mean, if you are no longer commuting to your job, if you're no longer taking your child to school, you no longer go to the downtown shopping district to do your Christmas shopping, you're probably living the vast, vast majority of your life within your own neighborhood. I know that is absolutely the case for me. There can be weeks that pass before I leave my neighborhood because there's just, there's just nothing to go to right now. And I'm fortunate in that there's grocery stores and things like that that I can reach. And so this idea has been embraced by a number of cities as, you know, one ideal to try to aspire toward when we think about building back, when we think about what a recovery would look like in cities. So, you know, if we are going to wind up in a long-term scenario where fewer people are commuting into the office every day, and you were to spend more time within your own community, could we try this is something that we should be doing anyway, but expanding grocery stores into food deserts so that people have the ability to, to do the errands within their own community. Um, you know, if it's going to remain a little while before lots of us get back on public transit, which is essential to reach the things that we need, you know, what would it mean for you to have things like a grocery store within walking distance of your home? So I think it's, it's an appealing idea for this particular moment because we are all paying so much attention to the environments immediately around us because we're just not going to other environments. But of course, this conversation is happening at the same time as you know we're having all of these much larger conversations prompted by the pandemic about inequity and inequity across our cities and racial injustice and racial inequity. And so those issues have also you know, been pulled into this 15-minute city conversation to ask, well, how viable is this idea for communities that have no commerce in them? How viable is this for communities that are entirely car dependent, that have really poor transit access, that you know, don't have very good walkable infrastructure? Do we even really want to aspire to have cities at the end of the day where everyone can do everything that they need within their own neighborhood in a context, particularly in the United States, where our cities as they exist right now are incredibly segregated. You know, one of the things that's so lovely about a city is that other communities are different from the one that you live in, and we travel to different kinds of communities and, you know, experience, you know, this is what's different in Chinatown, or, you know, this is what's different in the garment district. And so there's a little bit of a tension, I think, between this ideal of the 15-minute city and both some of our sort of deep-seated realities of segregation and inequality, but also some of our ideals about, you know, many of us have chosen to live in cities because we don't want to be in a little village. We want to be in something bigger that offers us more than what our own neighborhoods can. But it's prompted what I think is a valuable conversation about what are many neighborhoods currently lacking in this moment where so much of the world is closed to us? What else might we see in the new year? If it's not as critical to live near headquarters with more remote work, of course, will smaller cities like Hartford, Connecticut have new appeal? Or, dare we say it, the suburbs? Or, for that matter, the woods of Vermont? Some of the questions that I think would help determine the answer to that we don't fully know the answers to yet. So I think it is very likely that many employers are going to be more flexible with their employees than have been historically, because now they have been forced to realize out of necessity that maybe they don't need everybody physically in an office. When certainly many white collar office spaces in particular sort of subscribe to this idea that that was important to culture or that you physically needed to be together to exchange ideas, even if you didn't physically need to be together for other reasons. So I do think that there will be greater flexibility on the part of at least some employers. 
but I don't think I have a good sense yet of exactly what that will look like. Will that look like come in at least once a week? Or will that look like you're welcome to go live in Telluride? Because obviously those two things are going to result in very different choices. This obviously applies to only a very tiny population, but I'm fascinated by this question among tech employers who have said, you know, you can live other places. Are you going to pay them Silicon Valley salaries to live in Colorado Springs? Or are you going to adjust their income if they choose to live there? And if people are given that choice, how would they react to those sets of options? And I also just think we still don't have an answer to the question of how much of the things that were appealing to people about large cities are going to come back quickly and what are they going to look like? And I think that that also is going to impact people's decisions about whether or not they will choose to move somewhere else. I mean, we also don't even fully know how the housing market is going to settle out at the end of this. So my expectation is that there will be lasting changes in the nature of work and that will have housing and migration consequences, but I'm not yet confident in sort of predicting exactly what the extent of them will be or what they'll look like. Diana, where is housing headed? I see that Atlanta is the latest community to say that we can't just have single-family neighborhoods, that there should be many more places that are zoned for multifamily housing. And it also seems like 2020 may have triggered maybe a healthy, fresh look at housing. Tell us about all the other options you write about in your book, co-housing, carriage houses, the variety of options and approaches to housing that may have uh, gotten a boost. Sure. I think that the example in Atlanta, from what I can tell, the conversation there is really about how do they adjust some of these existing single-family housing zoned neighborhoods to have things like accessory dwelling units or to have duplexes, to have a little bit more density in them and certainly allow for new multifamily housing to be built going forward. You know, just in terms of what I've been able to read, it felt like a kind of tempered response to some of the discussion about banning single family homes, um, like the way that that has been portrayed, for example, in Minneapolis and the ways that some people kind of get really frightened by changing zoning from single family homes to something else. And so I thought it was a great example of how, you know, some zoning tweaks can really add some density to neighborhoods, some affordability by creating new housing types and sizes and price points. But I think in terms of how it really kind of fits into this larger picture of where housing is going as a result of the pandemic, one of the biggest trends from this whole period has been people moving in with family members or with their kin, with their friends to sort of expand their pod to also have an extra set of adults who could look after a kid who is in online classes, just the recognition that we are interdependent and we actually need to have kind of like a larger household to be able to both have a social life in these times of quarantine, but also to be able to cope with some of the new demands that people are facing right now. Um, Not to mention the sort of economic demands for many people that they've lost their jobs, they're moving back in with family. You know, when I was talking about trends that have been accelerated, I should have mentioned that that was certainly something that was trending. Multi-generational housing was really trending uh, pre-COVID. And I'm sure when we start to see some of the data of where it's at now, we're going to just see more and more people living with, you know, members of their family. And so I think that that has really increased people's interest in how can we live together, but live together with some degree of privacy or some degree of separation. And so people have become very interested in accessory dwelling units that could be built on their property, whether it's for a family member or even for a caretaker who is also sort of enabling them to live with their caretaker on site. So those kinds of options, I think, have become increasingly of interest. I also think that, you know, when we get to a point where people are more comfortable with some of the restrictions that they might have in social settings and um, in living situations, that trends like co-living, which had been really hot before the pandemic, will start to become 
increasingly of interest as people have just experienced this period of mass isolation and really hoping to connect with some sort of community again. I think that the sort of co-living in very expensive markets like New York and San Francisco may not recover that quickly just because the numbers of young people who are moving to those cities might be smaller for some period of time. But I think that the recognition that people are interested in more shared living situations with more experiences, more programming, more shared amenities, I think is going to continue to be of interest. I also think that there has been a focus for a long time on how housing is a form of healthcare um, and how we really need housing that can support people, whether that is traditional supportive housing for people who are formerly homeless, to thinking about the kinds of housing that sort of serves as healthcare for seniors and so on. But I think that, you know, another trend that was happening pre-COVID that will just be accelerated now is this idea of building housing intentionally to support people's health, whether that is kind of like the 15-minute city that Emily was talking about in terms of housing that is built intentionally to encourage walking, to intentionally have groceries and other types of social infrastructure nearby, that kind of idea of a holistic view of what it is to be a healthy person. Or I anticipate that there'll be more of hospitals and other healthcare institutions that become housing developers, recognizing that they have a real role to play in keeping people healthy and also in terms of addressing some of the housing shortages that are ongoing in a lot of cities, whether it's for, you know, low income people, whether it's for families uh, and so on. So those are a couple of things that I think will end up playing out in the next couple of months. And I think we're kind of trending beforehand, but especially as we start to see like what the return to normal looks like, I anticipate those trends kind of accelerating. Well, we can't cover everything, but how about a few thoughts on transportation? Transit systems are really hurting right now, but a lot of cities have used this period of time to do deferred maintenance or to put in things like bus lanes. If they could just make it through the here and now, can transit come back better? Um, Emily, what's your transport crystal ball tell you? And then we'll hear from Diana. There was a time in the spring when we saw this absolutely precipitous drop off in transit ridership. I mean, it just happened overnight and it was on the order of like 90% declines in transit cities all over the country. And sort of shortly after that happened, in talking to a number of different transit officials around the country, I sort of had this like slightly optimistic view that this is all gonna work itself out by the fall. And, you know, large transit agencies have been given enough money in the CARES Act that they could sustain themselves through the summer into the fall. They could, you know, plug a lot of their 2020 shortfalls. And as the time horizon of when we think we might get back to normal has just been pushed further and further back, we're now at this point in December of 2020, where I think this situation is just incredibly dire. It is really, really bad for transit agencies. And it is very difficult for me to envision any kind of situation where they just bounce back. Their time without fair dollars has been so long. You know, all kinds of other revenues that they depend on have been dried up for so long. Congress has left them hanging for so long that I think it is inevitable that many cities will see severe service cuts may even see fare increases. And this is going to have all kinds of really dire cascading problems for, you know, the ability of people to access jobs when the economy comes back, for the sort of underlying appeal of whether or not you could reach the things that are considered to be amenities in cities. Maybe this is my sort of bias as someone who, you know, cares a lot about sort of urban infrastructure and stuff, but I feel even more worried about the future of transit agencies than I do about like the future of the restaurant industry, uh, which is also quite dire. So I am not expecting them to bounce back better. I think it's more a question of if we saw a lot of transit agencies take years to recover from the Great Recession, I think that, you know, we should expect that and then some 
in this scenario. I mean, of course, this could all change if under a new Congress and a new aid package, they get a substantial amount of federal money. But I don't think that anybody should count on that at this point. It feels like a remote possibility now. And so transit agencies are going to have to make a lot of really difficult decisions about if we're pairing back service, who are we going to be serving? What does it mean to just tailor service to, you know, the people who are entirely dependent on transit and set aside all of our hopes about choice riders and, you know, expanding the ridership pool and things like that. When I think about ways that cities will be sort of scarred at the end of this experience in a way that makes them less livable, less enjoyable, more fragile. Some of the other things that we've talked about, like what will happen to, you know, people being allowed to work from home permanently and what could that mean for downtown courts and things like that. The thing that I most worry about is the weakening of transit systems, because at this point to me, it feels like a certainty that that will happen and the consequences of it are going to be so large. Diana, you'll have the last word, and uh, perhaps you could talk about the connection between housing and transport. With transit-oriented development, for example, you can't have transit-oriented development without the transit, right? What I would say is that we are going to have to set priorities, but I think it's really important at this moment that people who care about public transit serving cities speak up about that at this point, because it reminds me of something that I saw on Twitter recently about PennDOT and Pennsylvania clamoring for more money for highway expansion and rebuilding. And so if we're really concerned about transit that is going to serve underserved neighborhoods, that's going to serve, frankly, low-income people in Philadelphia or other cities, it's really important that we find a way to make that known and to share that. Transportation could be better if we actually use this as a time to reprioritize how our streets are used and what kind of transit we're focused on. Well, these are big questions, and we really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your reflections. Emily Badger and Diana Lind, thank you for this conversation. That's it for us for 2020 and for this episode of Land Matters. I'm your host, Anthony Flynn. Our best wishes to everyone for a safe and healthy holiday season. Until next time, thanks for listening.